Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to the today's show. Now, today, my guest says America is at a crucial crossroads, both internationally and domestically. In his new book, America in 2040, he asked, will we still be a superpower? And I guess that depends if we switch gears pretty soon. So joining me today is the author of the book, and I'll put it up here for you to all see. America in 2040, still a superpower, question mark and former U.S. Comptroller General David Walker. Hello, David, and welcome to the show. Good to be with you, Bob. All right. So, David, can you go ahead and please introduce yourself to the audience? And what makes you somebody that someone, someone listening would want to listen to concerning these issues going on in today's troubled times? Sure, Bob. I've got over 40 years of executive level experience in the private sector, public sector, not-for-profit sector. I'm a CPA by profession. I ran a worldwide line of business for the then largest accounting consulting firm in the world. I have run three federal agencies, two in the executive branch, one in the legislative branch. Uh, I've been a trustee of Social Security and Medicare. Most, my most recent full-time position in the government was as Comptroller General of the United States, which in English is Auditor General, Chief of, uh, Accountability Officer of the United States. I've been a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy teaching the economics of national security on the Defense Business Board, Chairman of the Audit Committee of the United Nations, and I've run two not-for-profits that focus on federal, state, and local fiscal responsibility and accountability. So my background is very diverse, but it's very, very relevant to the subjects covered in the book. Yeah, yeah, a very impressive resume. Um, how do you define the superpower, and what got us to the point that a former Comptroller General is questioning the tenure of the United States as a superpower? Well, I define a modern day superpower is a country that has global economic, diplomatic, military power and cultural influence. And since World War II, we're the only country that's really met all those definitions. The Soviet Union had global diplomatic in, uh, power and global military power, but it didn't meet the economic and cultural criteria. But now we're facing a re-emerging China who has either met those criteria or will soon meet them and are dedicated to passing this. And the other reason that I'm speaking out is we've lost control of our finances. The government's grown too big, promised too much. Uh, things are getting worse rather than getting better. Uh, and obviously, uh, you know, if you don't maintain economic superiority, the others are going to suffer over time. Yeah. Um, in your view, how badly has this country strayed from the vision of the founders and the U.S. Constitution? I think the founders would be rolling over in their graves if they could see what's going on today, quite frankly. I mean, you know, this country was founded on certain timeless principles and values uh, that we've strayed from. Limited but effective government, individual liberty and opportunity, rule of law and equal justice under the law, fiscal responsibility, intergenerational equity, stewardship, just to name a few. And what's going on right now is uh, we've lost our way and we're having a great debate between those basic principles and values that made us great and Saul Alinsky's socialist state principles. And I hate to tell you, but Saul Alinsky's principles are, are winning right now. Who, who, who's Saul Alinsky? Uh, he was, he was a, a PhD professor, uh, prominent uh, among the uh, progressive, uh, and, you know, progressive wing uh, or thinkers, if you will. Uh, and, um, you know, the book outlines uh, what our basic principles and values were that we were founded on and outlines Saul Alinsky's principles and values and Read them and you'll see what I mean when I say that he's one of them. Exactly. Um, Dave, can you give your thoughts on what's happening with the massive ideological divide, especially where leftism and socialism have become so mainstream? And what damage is it causing? Well, you know, we have a partisan divide, but we have an ideological divide, which is even more significant. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're not getting things done in Washington. You know, when you have large, known and growing problems, uh, you know, you can't do nothing because things get worse. The risk increases uh, and the and uh, the amount of changes you have to make to to get back on the right path are much, much greater, if you will. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, one of the reasons for it is not not enough Americans really understand the alternative. You only you don't know how good or bad you have it until you see alternatives. Uh, my wife and I are fortunate. We've been on every continent, about 100 countries. We've been to every state. We know different systems, and, you know, not just from the standpoint of reading, but actually experiencing those. We have friends that came from 
you know, other countries that, uh, you know, that uh, had, you know, socialist systems or communist systems, if you will. And they, and they know what the difference is, uh, you know. And, and so as a result, I think it, it's a lack of experience. Uh, and with regard to our political system, you know, our political system, it, you know, the, the way that we end up electing people, we now have a republic that is not representative of nor responsive to the general public. And we need re political reforms in order to revitalize our democracy and to be able to have a truly and effective functioning republic. Now, you, you talk about something in the book which I, I thought was really spot on. And it said, or you said, you talk about two pivotal years where government growth and scope really set us on a path for a loss of liberty and fiscal insanity. And that is 1913 and 2003. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, in 1913, three things happened that fueled the size, the growth of the size of the federal government and loss of control of the budget. I mean, one was uh, the federal income tax. Uh, the other one was the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. And the third one was the direct election of senators. Uh, rather than being appointed by states where they were supposed to protect states' rights or they didn't get reappointed, they, got, oh, they were directly elected by the people. And if you look at that, uh, two percent of the, the government was two percent of the of the economy in 1913, uh, and that's a good way to look at the size of government. You know how much is it spending as a percentage of the economy? Two percent. Before COVID-19, it was 21. During the last year, it was over 30. And if you look at the at President Biden's uh, you know new proposed budget, he wants to go to 25 and climbing over time. So the government's grown dramatically. States' rights have been undercut. So that's the first year. And the second one was 2003, if you want to go through that. Yeah, 2003. I, I assume you're talking about the Iraq War. Well, two, three things happened in 2003 that convinced me that Washington had lost control of the nation's finances and it really strayed badly from some of our basic principles and values. Uh, number one, uh, we had a second round of tax cuts that were all debt financed. They didn't pay for themselves and they made our situation worse. Uh, secondly, we invaded a sovereign nation without declaring war. It was supposed to pay for itself. It cost trillions of dollars and thousands of lives and caused a void uh, in the Middle East. All right. Uh, in, in addition to that, we expanded Medicare to add prescription drugs that aided, added eight trillion dollars in new unfunded obligations to Medicare when it was already underfunded 19 trillion. So those three things told me things are out of control. Yeah, it, it, I found that I found that to be some, one of the most interesting points you did in the whole book were those two years. Uh, a lot of people don't look at those two years in the same way, and that's maybe part of the problem, right? Um, Dave, can you talk about the importance of the dollar as the reserve currency? And is the dollar at risk of losing the status in your view? Well, by having a reserve currency, it means that you, know, you have significant competitive advantages with regard to trade and with regard to financing, okay? Because you're doing transactions in your own currency. So you don't have currency risk, if you will, among other things. Uh, and the U.S. right now has about 60% of the world's global reserve currency. Uh, that's a tremendous comparative advantage. Do I think we'll lose reserve currency status? No. Do I think that we're going to lose market share? based upon our current past? Absolutely, yes. I think uh, all the more reason why it's important, you know, for us to be able to restore fiscal sanity, um, you know, not just to be able to help promote greater economic growth and more opportunity, but to be able to maintain that reserve currency status and the advantages that come with it uh, through trade, financing, and otherwise. Yeah, it's been about 50 years now since, um... Nixon took us totally off the gold standard. Uh, Dave, what's your thoughts on the country going off the gold standard? Well, we basically now have a fiat currency. It's really, it, you know, the, the currency is good as the faith and credit that people have in it, right? <laughs> and, and, and I come back to what I said before, you know, you don't know how good or bad you have until you have something else to compare it to. You can't beat something with nothing. Uh, and, 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 you know, our, our major competitors for reserve currency status right now are the euro, which is number two. Uh, you have other currencies that are reserve currencies, such as the Japanese yen, the, the UK uh, pound, uh, Chinese yuan, uh, if you will. Uh, but I think one of the things you're going to see is you're going to see a number of countries start coming together to try, to try to create alternatives. 
whether they be traditional currencies, whether they be cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And we're already seeing uh, China, Russia, Iran, and certain other nations trying to align against U.S. economic, diplomatic, uh, national security, and cultural influences. It, it is clear. It is compelling. Uh, we need to take it seriously. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, the, the, a term that's been thrown around in recent years is mo uh, excuse me, modern monetary theory. What is it and what's the problem with it? Well, money doesn't grow on trees. Uh, <laughs> kind of, you know, part of what this theory is. I mean, basically, first, let's talk about what it is. Modern monetary theory is a new, unproven macroeconomic theory that says that you don't have to worry about deficits and debt uh, unless and until you have excess inflation, if you borrow in your own reserve currency. Well, we do borrow in our own reserve currency. We don't have excess inflation right now. We have historically low interest rates. Here's the problem with it. It's contrary to history. It's contrary to long standing economic principles. It's based upon a flawed comparison to Japan. Uh, and it, it, you know, if you follow it, it's likely to cause the excess inflation uh, that, that enables it in the short term. And furthermore, it's downright dangerous because what it does is it gives an excuse for people who, who want to grow government and want to do even more with regard to borrowing, gives them an excuse to do so. And quite frankly, you know, the modern monetary theory is very consistent with Saul Alinsky's socialist state principles. It is an enabler for those principles. Yeah. Uh, I'm, we kind of touched on this already, but I want a little more uh, detail from you. Uh, there is some there is some debate, depending on who you talk to, on the greatest threat to the United States now, militarily, economically, or otherwise. Uh, are you on the side that it's China or... Or are you on the side that it's Russia or somebody else? Well, I think China represents our greatest competitor. Uh, and I think that we can and should avoid a kinetic conflict with China. I don't think it's in either of our interests, if you will. But I actually think the greatest threat to America is not an external threat. It's an internal threat. Yeah. Uh, it's the fact that we've strayed from these principles and values. We've lost control of our finances. We face three growing gaps in America, income, wealth, and education gaps. Uh, that, that are a real challenge and that represent a, a, a legitimate domestic tranquility problem over time. So, so we need to recognize that we've got external challenges and we've got internal challenges. And with regard to security threats, you know, it, it's not just the, tr the traditional nation states. You've got bio, COVID as an example, you've got space and you've got cyber. And arguably, cyber represents the greatest threat to us right now with, with regard to a security threat, if you want to look externally. Um, you, you have quite a bit of experience in uh, social, social Security and Medicare. So very popular programs, um, very expensive social programs. Um, what's their future? Well, look, we're never going to abandon those programs. Uh, they're very important uh, social insurance programs. Social Security, as an example, is the most popular federal program that exists. Uh, it does have a financing challenge. You know, uh, we haven't seen the latest uh, trustees report. I was a trustee for five years from 1990 to 1995. I expect the latest trustees report, the new one that's going to come out, is probably going to say that the so-called trust funds uh, will be exhausted by 2031. What does that mean? It means that if you don't make reforms, that you've got to cut benefits 20 to 25 percent across the board immediately. That is unacceptable economically, is unacceptable from a human standpoint, and it's unacceptable politically. So something will be done, as it was in 83. If we're prudent, we'll do it sooner rather than later. The bigger problem is Medicare. Medicare has much greater uh, unfunded obligations. It is a subset of an overall health care challenge. Healthcare is approaching 20% of our economy and growing. It's growing much faster than inflation, much faster than the economy. We write a blank check for healthcare. We're the only nation on earth that writes a blank check on healthcare. Nobody else is dumb enough to do that. <laughs> we pay a lot more money and, than most nations do per person, uh, but we get below average outcomes per person. So we need some fundamental reforms 
uh, in the healthcare area, of which Medicare is a subset. Uh, we can solve both these problems, but we should do it sooner rather than later uh, before we, we face a real crisis. But Dave, are, are there actually any politicians out there that has the courage to do any of this? Well, there's actually a bill in Congress right now that's talking about forming, it's called the Trust Act, that would have formed several commissions, you know, one dealing with Social Security, one dealing with Medicare, one dealing with the highway trust funds, you know, uh, government programs that have so-called trust funds. And I put that in quote because I call them trust the government funds. They're not real trust funds. There's no fiduciary responsibility. And by the way, you know what's in those trust funds? Not stocks, not bonds, not real estate, U.S federal government debt, IOUs, but they are guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government and arguably by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. So they have substance, but uh, but you can't sell them. I mean, they're not marketable, right? They're, you know, you can't you can't sell them on the open market. So so the bottom line is, is that we you know, we have challenges here, but but, but there are ways to solve them. And in fact, one of the things the book covers is it covers, you know, a, a range of proposed reforms. In these areas and others, taxes, defense, political reforms, that a super majority of Americans agreed to in 2012, 80 to 90 percent agreed to as a way to solve the problem. You said, two, you said 2012. Things have changed a lot in nine years, though. Well, they've gotten a lot worse, but 2012 was the peak of people's concern about these issues. Mm -hmm. All right, it was the time that it was addressed as part of. Uh, any presidential campaign, all right? Yeah. But the truth is we're in much worse shape now than we were then, and the principles and, and values under which we agreed to to solve these problems are still valid, uh, and uh, most of the proposed reforms are still valid. Most of them have not been adopted. Yeah. Well, I am going to go ahead and um, jump on the national debt with uh, the younger Bush, who went from $5 trillion to $10 trillion. Obama... 10 to 20 trillion, Trump several trillion in a very short period of time. And God knows where we're gonna, where we're gonna end up after what Biden's doing right now. Uh, how long is this How long is this sustainable? Well, look, everybody, Republican, Democrat, unaffiliated, liberal, conservative, moderate, everybody agrees that we're on an unsustainable path. Everybody agrees that too much debt as a percentage of the economy has a negative effect on economic growth, all right? Everybody agrees that the real uh, metrics are debt to GDP, debt as a percentage of the economy, and interest as a percentage of the budget. Right now, interest rates are at a historical low, but it would be imprudent to assume that they're going to stay that way, given economic growth after we get out of COVID-19, given the amount of borrowing that we're doing, given what's happening with the, with the money supply, that we've expanded the money supply dramatically over the last year, if you will. Uh, and, and so, you know, the bottom line is, is that it is unsustainable. Now, how much debt is too much debt? That varies by country. You know, we, we can have a higher debt to GDP ratio than many other countries because of the size of our economy, because of the stability of our political system, and because of the fact that we have a reserve currency. But debt in excess of uh, uh, excessive debt clearly has a negative effect on economic growth, which has an adverse impact on opportunity, which and, and over time will result in uh, additional domestic tranquility challenges, as well as additional national security cha challenges, because it'll put more pressure on the defense budget, uh, which we can get into, by the way, because while we spend a lot more money than other nations, when you adjust for a number of factors, we're really not. We're really not. We'll, we'll go ahead and elaborate on that. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of people want to compare how much we spend as compared to other countries, but they don't want to make the necessary adjustments. And that's one of the problems with the modern monetary theory. It, it doesn't make the necessary adjustments uh, uh, to Japan. Let me explain. The United States spends a lot more money than about the same as the next 10 nations combined when you just talk about dollars, all right? Here's the problem with that. Number one, uh, when you adjust for purchasing power parity, in other words, how much can you buy with an equivalent dollar, right? Uh, you know, and you compare us to, to China, uh, you know, there, a dollar goes a lot further in purchasing power there. Secondly, when you consider the fact that most of their defense industry is owned by the government, 
it's owned by the government. They're not looking for a profit margin or anything else, all right? And the government gets all the profits. And thirdly, when you consider the fact that we have an all-volunteer force, which is incredibly expensive, and they have conscription, when you adjust for those three factors, they're spending about the same amount that we are. And then when you add Russia, who is clearly allied to China, and some of these other players, collectively, they're spending more than we are. And they are increasing their defense budgets. And let's look at the last budget proposal by the, by the current administration. They want to increase domestic spending by 16% plus, and they want to increase defense spending by 1.6%, which is less than inflation. So the bottom line is, is that it's really important that when you look at statistics, to be able to under, to compare apples and apples. And when you compare apples and apples, you get a very different answer than when you just look at nominal numbers. Um, Piggy, you, you mentioned uh, COVID-19 a few moments ago, and we saw this massive expansion of governmental powers at all levels um, in 2020. Do you think uh, we as a citizenry learned anything from this? Well, here's what's ironic. As I point out in the book, the, the second chapter is about COVID-19 and lessons from COVID-19, right? Uh, we were ranked number one in the world by independent parties in 2019 for our ability to handle a pandemic, all right? Now, maybe we were number one, but we clearly weren't adequately prepared, all right? Uh, and that we're overly dependent on China for personal protective equipment, so-called PPE. We're overly dependent on China for a lot of minerals and other things that are necessary for prescription drugs. There are major supply chain issues, not only in the United States, but around the world, you know, that, that, that have to be dealt with. Uh, and the other thing you got to keep in mind is that, you know, unlike authoritarian regimes like China, where if the central government says this is what you do or else, people will do it because the or else is not a positive outcome for, for the individual. We have different levels of government, federal government, state government, local government. The president can't tell governors what to do. They're sovereign states, okay? Uh, in addition to that, we have something called the Bill of Rights. People forget about that, you know, so we have certain rights. My personal view is uh, the federal government did not do a good job of balancing economic, public health, and personal liberty considerations. My personal view is the government tried to stoke, at least in, you know, during the last eight months or so, tried to stoke fear. Now, when you stoke fear, what does that enable? It enables government to, to grow mm -hmm. and, to control, and to exert more control over our lives. And now what we're finding out is a lot of things they told us, well, may not be true. And the source of this may be very different than what we were told, which by the way is referenced in the book as well. Right. Um, let's go ahead and talk about, you said there's reforms out there, it's in your book, um, that the government can take to turn this into a different direction. Uh, can you spend a little time talking about some of these reforms? Yeah, I'll just give you a few as an example because sure. the book lays out many, many different reforms. Okay, on the budget, okay, we don't want a balanced budget. By the way, 49 out of 50 states have balanced budget requirements. Very few of them have balanced budgets because the way they calculate a balanced budget is balancing cash flows. And how do you balance cash flows? You borrow more money. That's how you balance cash flows, okay? And they also don't count huge unfunded retirement obligations. But what we do have to do is we need to get rid of the debt ceiling limit, which hasn't worked. It's a bad joke. And we need to impose a debt as a percentage of the economy limit with targets, triggers, and automatic enforcement mechanisms if they don't work, okay? Uh, and we also have to recognize that just paying for new things that you wanna do is not adequate because that assumes that we're in good shape. We're not in good shape. So you have to start dealing, you have to start climbing out of the hole that we're in, if you will, and have a plan to do that. You know, with regard to taxes, yeah, we need to reform our tax system. Uh, to generate more revenue in an equitable and competitive way. And did we need to do comprehensive tax reform in 2017? Absolutely. But did we go more, did we do more than we really needed to do to be competitive? Or arguably so. I mean, arguably we didn't have to take it down to 21%. And there is a problem with regard to the need to have a global minimum tax. That's a legitimate issue. The enforcement of it is something else. Social Security, 
it's not that hard to reform Social Security. You know, I mean, you, you look at what the uh, retirement eligibility age is based upon longer lifespans. You look at what, how much in wages are subject to taxation, you know, and do what Reagan did back in 83 by raising the taxable wage bait cap and not eliminating it. Uh, there are things that you can do on health care. Uh, you know, you got to have a budget. You can't write a blank check. You need to start paying for outcomes rather than activities. Too much of our health care is based on fee for service rather than based on outcomes. Uh, you know, the government needs to be able to negotiate, you know, for, for prescription drug prices. OK, uh, if you will. Uh, negotiation is very different than saying, give me the lowest price that you charge anybody else anywhere in the world. That's a very different situation. OK, because there are implications on research and development uh, on defense. You know, uh, we need to be spending more for the tooth, which is the war fighting, and less on the overhead, the so-called tail. All right. Um, you know, and we also need to reform our compensation system because, believe it or not, there are three elements to compensation in the military. Cash pay, current benefits and deferred benefits. What's the most expensive? Deferred benefits. What's the second most expensive? Current benefits. What's the least expensive? Cash pay. That doesn't make any sense. OK, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, and, and what do people see? Cash pay. That's what they see. And political reforms. You know, we re, we need redistricting reform. We need integrated open primaries. We need 12 year term limits. We need campaign finance reform. So, you know, there's just a number of things that that are outlined in the book. Uh, and, and importantly, the, the ones that are emphasized are the ones that achieve 80 to 90 plus percent support from representative groups of voters and swing states in the North and the South. Uh, and that's what you need. You can't go by these, you know, opinion polls that say, would you like to pay more taxes? Would you <laughs> like to have to work longer for Social Security? What the heck do you expect people to say? I mean, these are mindless, worthless polls, you know. Uh, but as the book points out, just to close it, on this point is, First, you got to have a wake up call. Then you got to have a call to action. And then you have to show a way forward. That's what the book does. Wake up call. We're on an imprudent, unsustainable path. Call to action. We need to do something about it. Way forward. Here are some sensible solutions that have gained super majority support from representative groups of voters in America. Yeah, I, and I agree with many of your points. I just don't see. I see very few people in, in Washington that are willing to do a lot of this stuff because they've, well, had a, they've had a chance for many years. Well, first, you need to understand there's only one person that's elected by all the people, and that's the president of the United States. And the president's the chief executive officer. They have a disproportionate amount of power and a disproportionate responsibility. They have to lead whoever it is. OK, you can't run a country by committee. Congress is a committee. It can barely run itself much less the con Congress. It is dysfunctional right now. And it's been that way for a while, okay? Uh, so, so you need to recognize that. The other thing you have to recognize, you're not gonna get this done in the regular order, you know? Uh, and so we're gonna need uh, a new type of fiscal sustainability uh, commission uh, that unlike Simpson Bowl, actually engages the American people with the facts, the truth, the tough choices, actually solicits their opinions. And after doing that, then makes recommendations that will be guaranteed a vote in Congress up or down vote in Congress. That's what we need, all right? So, uh, and and I, I and others are working on trying to make that a reality uh, because I'm not worried about me and not really that worried about my kids. I'm very concerned about my grandkids' future. All right, so hypothetically, nobody in Washington reads your book and listens to your reform ideas. Where's the United States gonna be in 2040? Um, we'll still be a, a major country. We'll still be a major player. Uh, we will not meet the superpower definition. Uh, we will uh, uh, we will not be the leading power in the world, and we'll have more domestic tranquility problems at home. Doesn't have to be that way. I don't want it to be that way. The purpose is to make sure that it won't be that way. Uh, but you know, you have to recognize reality. We are not exempt from the laws of prudent finance. Touche. I, I totally agree. And again, the book is America in 2040, still a superpower. 
and I'll link to it in the show notes when I publish the podcast. And I want to thank you, David Walker, for sharing your thoughts with us today. I really appreciate it. Good to be with you, Bob. Thank you. All right.